Going inside the issues of our community, this is Local 12 Newsmakers. Every poll that asks the question reveals that health care, access, availability, affordability, coverage is a major concern of American families. Both presidential candidates had health care proposals, but it seems that the specifics got lost in the rhetoric, and action at best is years away. But locally, the city of Cincinnati is taking action to establish what many hope will be a model that will ultimately provide primary health care to every working Cincinnatian. Good morning and welcome to Local 12 Newsmakers. On October the 31st, City of Cincinnati City Council approved Cincy Care as a pilot project. The program is a collaborative experiment between the City Health Department, the Health Foundation of Greater Cincinnati, UMR, a United Healthcare Company, Interactive Health Solutions, LabCorp, and KGB Advertising. These entities are matching $1.7 million in cash and services to launch the pilot. CincyCare will provide coverage for up to 2,000 people who are working but don't have health benefits. An annual comprehensive health evaluation will be provided by Partner Interactive Health Solutions and LabCorp. Each enrollee will be assigned a primary care physician at a city health department center. A limited prescription drug benefit will also be allowed. The city portion of this experiment, $637,000 and a little bit more, will come from federal community development block grants and a $100,000 grant from the Health Foundation of Greater Cincinnati. To discuss the mechanics and the significance of this program, I'm joined this morning by its principal author, Cincinnati City Council Member John Cranley. John, welcome back to uh, Newsmakers. It's good to be back, Dan. Uh, this is a program you've been thinking about working on one way or another for a long time. Uh, how long has it taken to put this together? And this is just a pilot project at this stage. How long has it taken to put this together? About two years. We started on this just about two years ago. You know, at a time when all governments, but city government has a lot of things on its plate, especially with the economy. Why is this a good idea for the city of Cincinnati at this point? What's in it for the city? Uh, a lot of great things, Dan. Uh, first and foremost, as, as you point out, we have uh, thousands upon thousands of people who work for a living in our city and our region who don't have access to affordable health care. So first and foremost, I believe morally, if people work for a living, uh, they ought to be entitled to a living wage and some decent affordable health care. The problem is that it's increasingly unaffordable both for businesses uh, and for individuals. The second thing that the city, so having a more healthy uh, citizen is, is just a good thing. Uh, but secondly, what we're providing is an incentive for businesses to be in the city. What we hear time and time again from businesses who can't afford to provide health care for their workers, that they have problems with retention, they have problems with sick days, they have problems with productivity. And as you know, uh, those folks who get primary care avoid more serious problems down the road. And the problem with people who don't have health care is they don't check on problems that could be prevented. Those problems get much more serious than they should have, and then they end up in the emergency room and end up missing work for a much greater period of time. So this is a pilot program that will only be available to businesses that are located in the city of Cincinnati, providing a marginal reason for those businesses to be located in the city of Cincinnati. So it's good for the business climate, and that's good for the city. Yeah, we're taking the approach that um, that businesses would like to provide health care, um, but the way the economy works, some some jobs, especially in the service economy, fast food, uh, you know, things like graders, things like uh, Buskin Bakery, uh, things like uh, uh, Frisch's, UDF, uh, janitors. Um, they have two tiers of, of health care for their workers. Middle management and upper do get health care, but entry-level workers mm -hmm. generally do not. All those workers that you interact with all the time exactly. in those businesses. Now, who's eligible for uh, for Cincy Care? I mean, there's only 2,000 slots available in this pilot. Right. But what type of person is eligible? The most important thing is the person must work for a living. That's the key. This is a benefit. It is to reward work. It is not a, an additional welfare benefit. It is, it is meant to reward people who get into the workforce. So first and foremost, you have to have a job. Your employer has to be the point of entry as for verification purposes. 
that, that you in fact are employed, that your employer is the one that must enroll in the program and then once your employer has done so, you as an employee have a right to be part of the program. Secondly, uh, you cannot be eligible for other governmental or health or employer-based health care, meaning we don't want to give an incentives for companies to drop health care, nor do we want uh, nor do we want local tax dollars to be used if federal tax dollars are available for the health care that, that the individual is eligible for. So a business that has a health care plan now can't drop it and get into this? They can't drop it for this class of workers. Like I said, okay. many companies have several tiers okay. and entry level workers are not eligible for health care. So those companies and those employees are eligible for Cincy Care. But if they have an employer sponsored plan, uh, then they cannot be part of Cincy Okay. Care. Now, in terms of eligibility, and we have uh, a graph that shows its eligibility uh, two, by the way, um, that it talks about, th th well, this is one. This shows who is eligible, and this is what you were just saying. If we go to the next one, it shows the sorts of income levels that uh, of eligibility and it, your point is that people have to be working but you know the reality is that people can be making some significant dollars and still need health care it's expensive we look over here it's on the screen now so for one person family home right 37,000 plus a little bit and a four you know sort of the classic four person family $52,900, and is that the total family income if multiple people in the family are working? If it adds up to no more than that, is that what it is? Yeah, and that is a, the, the, the source of funds we're using for this pilot program are community development block right. grant dollars. And those dollars have very strict income guidelines on them. They are meant to be uh, for lower income or, or working, you know, you know, sort of the uh, quintessential working poor. This program is not designed for the middle class or the upper middle class. This is designed to reward those people who are just getting into the workforce or maybe they were on welfare and now they're back on mm -hmm. work and we want them to stay in the workforce to be productive. And Dan, you know, historically this, the health clinics, like most uh, government programs around the country, um, was one of those classic programs where if you didn't have a job, you got the benefit, and then once you got a job, you'd lose the benefit, although your job in some sense had, if you didn't have health care in your job, right. but you used to get health care at the clinic for free, you almost had a disincentive to go back to work. Especially if you had a family with children. Exactly. So this is a program specifically designed to try to reverse those uh, perverse incentives and to reward people who get into the workforce. Now, You've got a lot of partners in this, and I went through them very quickly, right. but let's, a person who enrolls in this, right. what will, what services will they actually get, and how will those be delivered, and because different partners deliver different parts of this. Right. What this is, and I don't, we don't want to oversell it, this mm -hmm. is a primary care, preventative care service. So you will get, as an enrollee, a personal private uh, not pri personal primary care physician. You will have the ability to go see your primary care physician as many times as you need to. And those primary care physicians will be at the city health centers. Correct. But you are assigned a specific doctor. Yeah, you get a specific doctor whose name and you know you, okay. you know exactly who the person is. You know you call okay. your doctor, you get an appointment. So you you can get your regular checkups. You can get your your n the normal medicines and care that you would get that we mo most of us are lucky enough to have private health insurance. The kinds of services we get at our primary care are all the services that are provided at our health clinics. And Dan, I don't know if you've been to our health clinics recently, but they do a great job. Mm -hmm. And uh, they've got very talented doctors and nurses uh, who are there. They are very busy. Uh, they have a, a, a dental. They have a, a lab. They have a, a pharmacy. Uh, there is a limited uh, uh, pharmacy benefit. So if, you know, for example, the goal here is for people who say have hypertension or diabetes, highly preventable and manageable diseases. It's when those goes undiagnosed and they don't take their medicines on a regular basis that they get more serious problems. So the point is to identify those issues, get that preventive care. Now, if something more serious, surgical or emergency, uh, long-term disability, et cetera, this program is not gonna solve those problems. There's also, um, not through the through the healthcare centers, that, right. but but through LabCorp, one of your partners, mm -hmm. a comprehensive medical exam right. every, each 
this is a two-year program. Right. So at the beginning of the first year and the beginning of the second right. year, uh, a really thorough exam, which I take it is going to include all kinds of diagnostic testing, which That's is right. really, I think, important. It's critical. People need to know what they may have genetically, what they may have through bad habits, and to get the information to change lifestyle, to change habits, mm -hmm. uh, to become better people. Now, this is a two-year pilot. Mm -hmm. What's it? G <laughs> Maybe you can't know when you mm -hmm. go into a pilot, mm -hmm. but what's it going to take to make this sustainable? Our partners and you're this whole range of partners, right. are they going to stick with providing, because they're all providing a lot of services way below their normal right. cost. What's it going to take to sustain this in the long run? Well, for Cincy Care, for 2,000 patients, it would be uh, fairly easy to, uh, to perpetuate, and that's because you know, the city receives roughly $25 million a year in federal pass-through dollars. This takes about $600,000 of the $25 million. And what I was able to convince eight out of nine members of council, Democrats, Republicans, and charter rights, that this was a better use of those dollars because it is to the benefit of working, the working poor, although not all these people are working poor. It is, you know, good for business, good mm -hmm. for companies that are located in the city. And so, um, the, the funding source is there to, for the 2,000 people right. to extend it forever if city council decides it's working, if the health department decides it's working, and if the patients and the employers are happy with the program in two years. I think we got to make sure that the customer service is good. We got to make sure that there's a good fit between employers and the program. Now, beyond the 2,000 right. people, um, you know, uh, the Greater Cincinnati Health Foundation is part of this Access 100 which is trying to find a medical home, a primary care medical home for every person in the region. I personally believe that this model um, could be expanded at least countywide. Hmm. Uh, my idea is to convert the uh, Drake levy, um, reprogram it entirely since it's going to expire in 2009, uh, and probably for a less am lesser amount. Um, and use that as a way to figure out a way to get everyone in Hamilton County into a model like Cincy Care and use the community health centers in the suburbs, Lincoln Heights, et cetera, um, uh, to be part of this. Do you have any sense of the demographic, the, the, the statistical number of people who would fit into these eligibility uh, categories? Well, we don't know because while there, there are, you know, probably, you know, over a hundred and some thousand people who individually fit into these categories. The combination of family income of more than one person plus working for a business that's located in the city yeah. um, probably winnows it down pretty quickly. Okay, I'm just about out of time, but did you pick up these ideas? Is this being also tested in other cities? And the other side of this is, since you've been working on it, have other cities contacted you about what, you're, what we're going to be doing here? Well, we did look at uh, programs in Muskegon, Michigan, and the city of San Francisco. Um, and actually, the idea for this, Dan, was a couple years ago we got into a major budget fight mm -hmm. in, in city council, and there was a t uh, there was a, a movement to close two of the health clinics, mm -hmm. which would have turned away fifteen thousand people who currently rely upon these clinics. Uh, these are the poorest of the poor who need uh, the services. And I came down on the side of preserving that safety net in the city. I think that's the right thing to do. However, I, th I took seriously the idea that uh, we ought to do more with these clinics and that maybe there were some efficiencies that could be had. Well, I discovered that there was some excess, not a lot, but there was some excess capacity in these clinics. And so my idea was why not, in essence, use that excess clinic, excess capacity as an incentive for businesses to be located in the city so that businesses don't feel that they're merely paying taxes for a liability for people who aren't working, right. but that by locating in a the city, they would get the benefit of their tax dollars being put back to work by providing health care for their workers. When can, and I'm just, I'm out of time, but when can people begin to sign up for this? December 1st. December 1st, and it has to be done through their uh, employer, right? Through their, their employer needs to be the, the primary contact. Okay. For people who want to find out more about this, either individuals or employers, a website, 
for Cincy Care is now up and operating. The website includes background information, information for employers, employees, and a way to request information. As John said, the plan will begin enrolling participants the 1st of December, and only 2,000 slots are open for this initial uh, two-year experiment. To access the website, go to www.cincycare.org. John, thank you very much for thank being you, here. And let's, this is important. We'll be back onto this one. Stay tuned. The Legal Aid Society of Greater Cincinnati is making a, marking a century of service. After the break, I'll be joined by the author of a new book on that century and the head of Legal Aid. Welcome back. The Legal Aid Society of Greater Cincinnati provides legal representation for lower income residents of Brown, Butler, Claremont, Clinton, Hamilton, Highland, and Warren counties. The cases that the agency accepts range from housing cases to employment, domestic violence, child safety, education, and other areas. I have heard some attorneys in private practice refer to legal aid as the best law firm in town. 2008 marks the centennial of the Legal Aid Society, and that story is told in this brand new book entitled To Secure Justice and Protect the Rights of the Needy. I am joined now by the director of the Legal Aid Society of Greater Cincinnati, Mary Asbury. Ms. Asbury has been with the Legal Aid Society since 1979, is the executive director since 1988, and Fritz Casey Leininger, the author of The New History. Fritz is an adjunct assistant professor of history at the University of Cincinnati, whose research has focused on poverty, race, and social justice. Welcome to Newsmakers. This, Thanks, is, this is wonderful. Mary, um, let's begin with Legal Aid Society today. How big is it? I, I, I ran through those categories, but you give me your personal description of legal aid. Well, sure. Today, Legal Aid is a law firm with about 50 lawyers. We are based in Cincinnati, and we have an office as well in Hamilton and in uh, Wilmington, Ohio. And as you mentioned, we have seven counties in southwest Ohio where we are providing legal help to people in all kinds of civil cases. We do not do uh, criminal defense work, but we do a wide range of other things. And right now, our biggest focus is helping people save their homes, people who are facing foreclosure. Uh, we have been really overwhelmed by the uh, need to help people with that, and um, we're able to do quite a lot for people who find their way to us. One of our other big areas is helping to keep kids in school. We are working with families whose kids have disciplinary problems, special ed issues, things like that, so that they can stay in school and stay on track to graduate. Um, Fritz, a century ago, could the people who organized, founded Legal Aid Society of Cincinnati, could they have imagined that kind of size, scope, professionalism, full-time dedication? Well, no, it's, it was a very different society at the beginning. It was um, in the first four years, it was volunteer lawyers uh, working out of their offices, uh, working out of the Cincinnati Union Bethel Settlement House. Um, for many years, uh, starting in 1912, they had um, a chief counsel named George Silverman, but um, Silverman remained part-time with the society throughout his life. On the other hand, they were highly professional. Um, Silverman uh, became a specialist in, in poverty law, what we would now call poverty law. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, that Silverman and uh, the, uh, the founders would not be surprised at the kinds of, of issues that Legal Aid is dealing with now, uh, um, many of the same issues. Um, now, one of the things, though, is that, at least my understanding is that Legal Aid for many years handled not just civil cases, as you were describing, but also cr criminal cases. And that ultimately got split off into the public defender's office and the public defender system. A am I right about that? At the beginning, it was both things? Well, at, at the beginning, it was just civil law. That, it was just civil law. But in, there was a major reorganization of the society between 1927 and 1928, where they added what they called the voluntary defender, who um, went into police court, um, or in actually the police jail um, early in the morning, um, found people who hadn't been able to bail, who had been arrested overnight, hadn't been able to bail out, 
um, and tried to make sure that they got at least a modest amount of, of legal defense. Um, so for many years, there was a single voluntary defender who, who worked in police court. Mm -hmm. um, by the um, uh, early 70s, uh, that program actually began to expand. And in fact, Legal Aid had two different um, criminal defense programs that eventually were, were reunited. And, and those folks uh, became a in the mid-70s became a much more uh, assertive um, and much more um, um, comprehensive uh, criminal mm -hmm. defense program. Mary, in some cities, in some regions, metropolitan regions across the nation, those two functions, criminal and civil, are still together. Uh, am I right? They are in a few places, but uh, by and large, the public defender system has uh, separated from the civil legal aid side. And um, I think that Cincinnati was probably one of the later ones to operate both. Uh, okay. At this point, with you know, your focus on civil, uh, where does your funding come from? What's the range of funding? Because this is, a, as you say, it's a big law firm. Well, right. How do you do this? Well, our, the biggest source of our funding, although it's shrinking fast, is the interest on lawyer trust accounts. And uh, that is a pool of funding in the state of Ohio where um, interest is accumulated out of all of the uh, accounts that are held in trust in law firms and then are distributed out to the legal aid societies. Also at the state level, mm -hmm. there is a small portion of the fees that people pay to file a lawsuit that comes out to the legal aid programs. There is some federal funding that's less than 20 percent uh, through something called the Legal Services Corporation. We get a substantial United Way grant and uh, really count on their support and we work very closely with other United Way agencies in the services. We have overall about 30 funders. Um, City of Cincinnati, Hamilton, Middletown, a lot of charitable donations, and then a, a big base of maybe 400 individual donors. But one of the interesting things is what you were talking about at the beginning, the large legal system as a whole does find ways of supporting the legal aid efforts throughout the state right. through these other, and, and so it's the, the whole profession is making a contribution here. Well, and Dan, one thing I want to mention is that another way they do is through the Volunteer Lawyers Project, which is a sister program with Legal Aid, and we've got about 600 private lawyers who take cases on a volunteer mm -hmm. basis that really expand the reach of what we can do. Fritz, if we got limited time, but if you had to point, not on, on the founding part, but if you had to point to one set of decisions, incidents, that were critical in shaping the culture of the Legal Aid Society over its past century. What would you focus on? What was that critical turning point? Well, actually, there were two critical turning points. There was one uh, in the late 20s where the society expanded its um, lawyers, um, became much more professional. Um, and then with the advent of federal funding for legal aid in, in uh, 1966, um, just tripled the size of, of Legal Aid's funding and turned it into a much, much larger, um, very different kind of organization. And that had, was controversial at the time. Um, some people feeling that the federal government was then funding lawsuits that were challenging government policies and, and there was a lot of controversy around that. There, there was, but throughout Legal Aid's history, I mean, Early in its history, Legal Aid worked on legislative reform, um, and their um, doing that came out of their daily casework, and that was true uh, with the advent of federal funding. They looked at what their clients needed, and they said, we're cranking out thousands of cases a year. We need to reform the law, and that law reform strategy at, that, that happened with fed, under federal funding came out of the daily casework. Okay. They were responding to what their clients needed. I'm aware of time here. Mary, where will people be able to get this new book? 
Well, they will be able to get it uh, this coming Thursday at a uh, seminar presentation. We're going to talk about that. And then after that, through the Legal Aid Society Legal Aid and Society. on our website. Okay. If you would like to learn more about the history of legal aid in Greater Cincinnati and cannot wait for the book, Fritz Casey Leininger will be speaking as part of Cincinnati Museum Center's Seminar on the City uh, series this Thursday evening. The presentation is free and it begins at 7.30 in the auditorium just off the rotunda. I also want to alert people interested in the history of computing to a conference this Tuesday on the 50 years of computing at the University of Cincinnati. This Tuesday at the College of Applied Science at the University of Cincinnati. For information and registration, just Google UC Conferencing. I'll be joined in the second half of the program several weeks from now with several people who are on that program. The first half will f of next week will focus on Northern Kentucky's effort to end smoking in public spaces. Have a good week, and thank you for joining us on Local 12 Newsmakers. Thank you.